this, uh, this lecture is based on a book um, that is a compilation of chapters from animal law and environmental law experts. The, the first edition was in 2015. The second edition came out in, in 2020. And these are colleagues that I've worked with for many years. They're, they're really fantastic experts on a wide, wide range of these topics that the uh, fields intersect around. And so today's talk, I'll be speaking to some of those issues. It's a, it's a uh, expansive book. The first edition was 17 chapters and the second edition uh, ballooned to 29 chapters. So certainly won't be able to cover all of those topics, um, but uh, certainly hitting some of the highlights today anyway to give you a flavor of, um, of the book's coverage really along two themes. Initially, what, uh, what and as the title of the book suggests, what animal law can learn from environmental law. And I'll talk a bit about that. And then uh, more recently, uh, the focus of the second edition of how these two fields can and ought to work together more effectively. Um, so I'll briefly take you through the uh, the evolution of that book concept and and my role in the animal law field. I'm a, I'm a latecomer. I, I really have devoted my full career to environmental law and that's three decades worth and the last decade uh, animal law has been added into that mix, which has really been really exciting for for what I do uh, in my teaching and and um, and writing on these two fields. Um, so I'll take you through a comparative evolution of these two movements, just how different they are, even though they share a lot of uh, similar goals and, and, and challenges. Uh, environmental law is much more uh, advanced. Uh, it's the senior of the two movements and has enjoyed more success in the, in the legal system compared to animal law. So animal law does have some lessons to learn from environmental law, but uh, there are also many opportunities for collaboration between these two fields. I'll give you a couple of examples there and, and close out with some very current issues uh, that are focuses, uh, focus areas for some of the new chapters in the second edition that um, in, the, in the food law space in particular uh, with deceptive advertising and uh, lab grown meat. And then of course, would love to hear your, your questions and comments. <clears throat> so this slide just talks you through this kind of process for me coming into animal law uh, as a career environmental law professor. I was asked to teach animal law for the first time at uh, Florida A&M Law School, where I was teaching at the time in 2014. And uh, coming into animal law, um, it, there, there was a lot to learn, uh, but also uh, a lot of what I had done was relevant to animal law. Um, I tell my students that animal law is one of the best bar review courses in disguise. It's, it's so expansive. It covers so many different areas of the law. And certainly my background from torts and constitutional law and environmental law were all really relevant to, to dive into an animal law um, course for the first time. So what I learned though in, in preparing that book and teaching that course was these lessons that I'm about to share with you, how, how environmental law as the more senior of these two movements really uh, has some valuable lessons for animal law and how there's absolutely a lot of common ground where these fields can work together. Um, and you may not know, but really both movements have their own divides within them as well, which, which sometimes interferes with this opportunity for collaboration. Um, the animal welfare and animal rights sides of animal law don't always see eye to eye. And uh, likewise within environmental law, there's some parts of that field that have different priorities and, and strategies, whether it be pollution control or natural resources or energy. They're, they're different land use. They're all different pieces of a larger whole that's often called environmental law. And they're not always on the same page either. So you think about it from, from uh, the standpoint of history, um, there's been a very different trajectory here for environmental law compared to animal law. And, and that's really the foundation, um, unfortunately, that, um, explains how environmental law was able to be much more successful. Uh, and that is really summarized by the understanding that much of what environmental law represents is protecting humans. Uh, even though it's called environmental law, many people think of environmental law as being all about the environment. Uh, it really is about protecting ourselves from our pollution of the environment. So. When you look at uh, how our federal environmental law system was launched in the 1970s, uh, it was based on this recognition of the pollution we were causing to our environment 
And it wasn't about this awakening about how we needed to protect environmental resources because they had intrinsic value. It was about how we were endangering our own health and safety as humans from the way we were polluting the environment. So whether that be the uh, air pollution, the Clean Air Act, motivated by how bad the smog had become in, in Los Angeles as, as one of many examples of how air pollution was getting out of hand, how a river caught fire in Ohio, how was that was part of motivating um, a force behind the Clean Water Act. All of these around 1970, which was the Earth Day movement really gaining a lot of attention for the need to be a better steward of the planet as we continue to advance economically and industrially. And then the, the hazardous waste uh, debacle in, in Love Canal, upstate New York, motivating our hazardous waste um, site law called CERCLA. So all of these laws that, that really came on the scene, ironically, under a Republican administration, many of them, the Nixon administration was the uh, administration in charge when all of these federal environmental laws were launched and Congress was actually not dysfunctional back then the way it is now. So what's important to remember is that all of these laws were motivated by science that was telling us about the human health and welfare concerns that pollution was causing to us. And that's why it was able to gain the political traction to get those laws in place on such a, a, a uh, rapid uh, basis. So when you compare that to animal law, it's fundamentally different. I mean, the animal law initiatives that we see are typically motivated by compassion for these voiceless entities that uh, deserve the protection of the law. They, they need human guardians and stewards for, for their protection. And there's really not that same sense of what's in it for us humans uh, when we talk about getting animal laws passed. And, uh, and that was really a, a stark difference between these two movements about, especially at the federal level, how we were able to get so much um, taken care of at, uh, at the federal level for environmental law and not at all uh, at the, for, for animal law, uh, for environmental law enjoying the success, animal law not. So that translates into politics too, because when you, when you need that political will um, to get something passed, it's much more likely to get passed if there's human health and safety concerns, much less so if it's animals as different from humans as the, the foundation for why we're uh, establishing the law. And of course, when Congress is devoting money to something to, to launch a big regulatory system, uh, it's gonna be hard to get that political will behind it when it's just for the sake of animals and not really for, for a, a direct benefit for humans. And then we have to also think about how the legal system works and, and what um, helped support animal uh, environmental law's success. First of all, we're talking about federal law. And the reason why there was this mandate for a massive explosion of federal environmental law was because the recognition that environmental laws are fundamentally transboundary in nature. So, so prior to the 1970s, we had these these little state fiefdoms really of regulating environmental problems in different ways on a state by state basis, not fully uh, addressing the reality that environmental problems don't stay in one place, that, that we really do need a federal response to environmental problems to be effective. Air pollution moves, uh, water pollution moves, species move. Um, so that and the science that was driving environmental law, both of which uh, really helped support that, that massive explosion of, an, of federal environmental law that we saw. Um, and that's abs absolutely not true when we talk about animal rights and, and animal welfare issues, much more on a, on a local individual animal species kind of basis, not looking at transboundary issues in most instances, of course, species protection is one of those issues that does kind of cross between environmental law and animal law. But in most, when we're talking about welfare initiatives, we're not talking in most instances about, about transboundary issues the way we do with environmental law. And science, science was really there to support all of these environmental problems and, 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 and what, uh, what, what threats were being posed to humans. We're just seeing now some advances in animal sentience science that are really helping animal law get the traction we need to, to better protect animals. Um, so the, the fact that we're learning so much more about how animals are very much like us, um, and that is helpful to, to animal laws campaign to get better legal protections for animals if science is telling us how much their lives 
uh, intellectually, uh, emotionally, communicatively are very much like humans. Uh, but that was not true, certainly, 30, 40, 50 years ago. And that's how environmental law got way ahead of animal law. So uh, way back when environmental law was very much in its infancy prior to the 1900s uh, and, and into the early 1900s, we did have that sense of stewardship for environment. Um, so uh, protecting wilderness areas, uh, developing our national park system, we, we recognized how there is something intrinsically valuable about nature and we ought to have our laws get out there and protect nature for its own sake. Um, it's valuable for nature, it's valuable to us as humans. But then, you know, big 50 years or more passes and the pollution control era was launched in the 1970s. That's our second box here. And that is something that is um, an era we're still living in, really. The vast majority of our laws are premised on that notion of pollution control uh, for environmental law protection. And it's only recently, really the past decade or so, that we've seen this launch of an, an environmental rights movement. So, so the rights of nature movement is, is quite uh, significant now, and that's really very much in its infancy still, but gaining traction. Um, and, and that's also happening around the world, perhaps on a, on a faster basis than it is in the US. So there have been some efforts in the US, but not, uh, not succeeding as readily as we've seen in other countries on environmental rights issues. We're also seeing that in the climate justice movement, a lot of rights-based theories being advanced in the courts now in the US and around the world. So if you look at that compared to the evolution of animal law, very different trajectory to consider. And this is really more, um, again, on that individual species focus, uh, that animal law driven by compassion as a focus. So anti-cruelty laws, uh, just you know, less than a decade ago now, maybe uh, the 50th state had um, uh, anti-cruelty protections put in place. So now all 50 states have some version of largely misdemeanor, but a growing body of felony um, protections uh, regarding anti-cruelty. Um, and so that's okay, that's a start, but it's nothing to cheer about when you think about how much that doesn't reach when we wanna protect animals of all kinds. So when you think about anti-cruelty protections, they're largely about protecting companion animals. This is the, the, the focus of anti-cruelty laws. Um, so there's a big part of the animal kingdom that is not getting the protection it deserves when we talk about anti-cruelty, animals in agriculture, animals in research and so forth, animals in entertainment. Um, so, and, and the other reality about anti-cruelty that's important to remember is that it's subject to prosecutorial discretion. So anti-cruelty laws are being enforced by criminal prosecutors that are also handling cases involving murder and rape and so forth. And so even when an anti-cruelty violation is detected and reported, the likelihood that it's gonna ultimately be prosecuted is far from a guarantee. And it's also very difficult to detect these violations in the first instance. Uh, so a lot of this cruelty happens behind closed doors and it's not something that's easy to detect. And so you've got really two barriers about whether these anti-cruelty laws are as effective as we'd like them to be. Um, and then uh, when you think about federal and international protections, there, there's virtually nothing. I mean, we, we have three, three federal uh, animal laws and they're, 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 they're worth very little, um, very ineffective. Um, one of them is oxymoronically called the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act. And so basically you're, you've got a law that's designed to proceed from the assumption that animals are being raised for the sole purpose of being eaten. And when they are slaughtered, the only way the law is protecting them is to make sure that they're rendered insensible to pain before they get slaughtered. And even that is not enforced very well. So that is hardly a, a measure of protection that's worth cheering about when you think about all the other ways in which animals are, are abused in that process of, of being raised and ultimately slaughtered and transported as well. The, the, the 28 hour law provides, you know, that, that, that there be you know, food and water available when you're being transported by truck for more than a day. Um, so these are, these are very minimal protections at the federal level. It's really state law that's doing what we do see for animal law. Uh, the, the, the good for animals is happening almost exclusively at the, at the state level for animal protections. Uh, internationally, we have another barrier, which is sovereignty of nations and cultural 
distinctions. So it's very easy for us to have a robust set of international environmental laws because of the transboundary principle. Again, we've got lots of international environmental treaties because we share this planet with all the other nations and we have that shared interest collectively in addressing these environmental problems that span uh, beyond national borders. But with animals, we've got different cultural uh, attitudes towards animals and how we, we engage with animals country by country. So it's very difficult to get global level animal protections in place like we see with environmental issues. Uh, nonetheless, we do see an animal rights movement that's gaining a lot of traction now, even though those first two boxes have not been nearly as successful as the evolution of environmental law. There's a lot of uh, engagement now on animal rights uh, litigation um, in the US and around the world on a variety of very creative theories that we'll talk about briefly today. So when we look at environmental law, there's some things that environmental law does very well that animal law can learn from and, and, and benefit from. So I'll just provide these two examples about information, access and dissemination and standing and personhood. So it's important to remember that environmental laws, federal environmental laws are premised on this idea that information is what drives the ability for the laws to work well. So when you think about how a, a, a regulated entity under the Clean Water Act is subject to the law, they are required under the Clean Water Act, for instance, to provide discharge monitoring, monitoring reports that are public information. So basically they hold a permit that has certain limitations and they are required to disclose whether they are meeting those limitations of their permit or if they're exceeding the limitations. And that is public access, publicly accessible knowledge that public interest groups can then go in and sue for violations of the permit terms and ultimately enforce the act quite, quite readily. Um, and this is a, a leading example around the world how, how these environmental laws work because that's not the, the common model of how environmental enforcement works. It's, it doesn't require the regulated community to be so forthcoming with their compliance history. Um, and then we've also got acts like the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act that allow communities to, un, uh, to be informed of what hazardous uh, chemicals are in their, in their communities that might pose a threat to their, their safety and, and health. And so that's another example of access to information under environmental laws. And then dissemination of information is even um, more powerful in many ways. So we have a law, the National Environmental Policy Act, that is premised only on that idea that before a federal agency conducts a project that might harm the environment, they must prepare an environmental impact uh, assessment. And once that is prepared, that's all they have to do. It, it doesn't say if, if something's gonna be harmful, then you can't proceed with the project. It just requires that dissemination of information to the public that this is what uh, might happen from the project. It might impact wetlands, it might impact species. But the, the dissemination of information itself is so powerful that that publicity can often interfere with that project moving forward. And also there is delay associated with the information being disseminated. So, so NEPA, even without an enforcement mechanism is one of the most effective uh, environmental laws we have in, in the US, the federal laws, because of how potent the dissemination of information to the public can be. That when that does reach the public, it often is followed by threats of lawsuits uh, by statutes that do have enforcement mechanisms. Uh, and there's often such a delay that when a project is proposed under one presidential administration, it might, you might witness the passage of one administration to the next, and then that project will get defunded and it won't happen. So delay is a really big friend of environmental advocates as well, publicity and delay. So compare this to the animal law legacy and we see something fundamentally different. So. Um, essentially, we have a bad situation that's made even worse by something known as ag-gag laws. So animal advocates do not have the benefit of what's happening in factory farms being disclosed to the public and therefore having the information they need to enforce uh, uh, based on that disclosure. That doesn't work that way at all. They are essentially operating behind closed doors. The same is true of animal research um, facilities. 
And basically, there are undercover investigations that occur that try to access information that is not required to be disclosed. And so then we have this added barrier with these laws known as ag gag laws that are trying to thwart that effort to conduct undercover investigations of, of these facilities to get information that isn't otherwise required by law. And fortunately, those laws are being struck down uh, on, on constitutional grounds, First Amendment grounds. Um, they're essentially criminalizing the, the, the desire to access information that is not being provided to the public. Um, but it's a stark contrast when you see the environmental laws are designed with information being provided. And when you look at how factory farms and medical, re and medical research facilities that conduct experiments on animals operate, it's all about protecting their ability to operate behind closed doors. And that is obviously a huge problem for, for animal protection. Um, so certainly there are uh, ways of just getting information to the public that can help drive down demand for things that are harmful to animals. So labeling is, is a huge strategy there. So um, there is um, so much opportunity for the public to make more informed choices when they have information that wasn't otherwise provided. And I always give the example of um, some fast food restaurants and uh, donut shops decided to put the calories on the menus of the items they were serving. And that had a significant influence on my choices of what I was going to have with my coffee. I didn't need a dinner's worth of calories with my, with my cup of coffee. Uh, and so just providing that information can have a, an immense impact on choices. And we don't have that when it comes to animal products. In fact, we have a lot of disinformation campaigns about the choices we make with respect to food that ultimately have negative impacts on animals. So I grew up with the, with the disinformation campaigns about steak is what's for dinner and milk does a body good, all of this messaging that was partially subsidized by the government um, created this sense of, I'm doing good by making these choices that I don't really have the information I need to decide is this really what I should be eating if I care about animals, if I care about the environment. Um, so there is some talk now about getting labels that would be good for the environment, good for animals, related to our concern about climate change. So there, there could be carbon footprint labels on meat packages. If, if this is something that would be a way of getting information to the public about, certainly um, your choices about what you eat have an impact on the environment. And just a label that talks about carbon footprint of different products would be useful to the public. Of course, it'd be more useful if there were just horrific images of factory farms on the meat packages, but we're not gonna get there anytime soon. Um, so then we've got standing as, if you're concerned about something as a public interest advocate, you wanna get into the courts. Um, and the environmental movement has had much more success here. Both environmental and animal advocates are about playing this guardianship role. They're being stewards for those that cannot protect themselves. Um, what's different in the environmental context, two things really. One is that way back in the 70s when these laws were implemented, the federal environmental laws, um, there was a, a trail blazed for public interest advocacy when they were established. Many of them have citizen suit provisions. So that alone lowers the standing barrier, it doesn't eliminate it but it greases the wheels to get those public interest advocates into court. Um, we also have a reality that what it means to be injured is very different in environmental law compared to animal law. So injury under environmental law was read quite expansively in those early cases, 70s and 80s, to include um, recreational interests. As an environmental advocate, if you're a hiker or a canoeer, um, uh, a, a fisher, um, that's one way to allege that an environmental project is harming you personally, you, you have been injured. Uh, conservational interests as well, if you're, if you're an advocate for forest protection or river conservation. Um, and aesthetics also recognized as an injury to environmental advocates if a project is just threatening a beautiful viewscape that you enjoy. Um, on the animal side, that's very different. You have to show that somehow you are personally harmed by a threat to an animal. And that's very difficult uh, for, for animal advocates. There are very limited exceptions to that to secure standing. 
that I won't go into today, but that that landscape is is a stark difference. When when you think about the ability of environmental advocates to get into court to argue about what they care about versus animal advocates. Uh, and so we're also looking at fundamentally different landscapes in terms of the government's role. So we have an environmental protection agency. The environmental protection agency is essentially a steward for protection of the environment, a government steward that is ultimately enforcing laws that are meant to protect against environmental harm. We certainly don't have an animal protection agency. Don't think the USDA is it. That's a far cry from the answer. So we do not have the equivalent of EPA for animals. And so we don't have that government stewardship model built in when we talk about animal protection the way we do for environmental issues. And uh, Massachusetts EPA is an example of that. Um, the, the climate change case in 2007 before the Supreme Court, uh, the, the court concluded that the state of Massachusetts had what they identified as special solicitude, which was an unusual term that bar borrowed from a, an old doctrine uh, from an earlier environmental case. The idea is that the state had the capacity to bring this lawsuit against the EPA on behalf of the citizens of Massachusetts who were collectively experiencing a loss of coastal land from sea level rise. And basically the court recognized that the state of Massachusetts had this guardianship role of its territory to sue on behalf of its citizens to protect against further loss of coastal land in the face of sea level rise. We don't have any equivalent of that for animal protection. We, we, we certainly don't have that notion of the state or the federal government acting as a trustee or guardian for the welfare or rights of, of animals. Uh, we, we just don't have a parallel for that yet. We, we should, but we don't. Uh, and this relates to personhood as well. One, one thing that is a head scratcher as this um, suggests in the photo, that we, we, the law recognizes that um, you don't have to be a human being to be protected with legal personhood. Legal personhood is really just about who matters, what matters under the law. So corporations enjoy legal personhood, ships enjoy legal personhood. There's a lot of movement now for artificial intelligence to be recognized with legal personhood. I just saw an article about the, you know, the chat GPT uh, and, and had the concept, the implications for legal personhood recognition there. Um, and as you'll see shortly, even natural resources around the world are being um, conferred with legal personhood. Um, and so all of these non-human entities getting legal personhood and yet animals do not. Uh, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you think about the parallels between animals and humans, how they're really just part of the same spectrum and how the law is so reluctant to confer legal personhood uh, to, to animals. And in part, that's a reflection of our relationship as humans with animals, that, that animals are used for our benefit. They're part of our food system, our entertainment system, our medical research system. And so there's always this implicit fear that conferring legal personhood to animals is going to cause chaos to our society, that, that we're gonna be living in a Planet of the Apes film or something, that, that it's just going to turn the, 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 the sense of what human society is uh, into disarray if we recognize legal personhood for animals, which is ridiculous um, because it's first important to understand that conferring legal personhood to animals does not mean they're gonna have a right to vote and a right to marry. It's, it's about a limited set of protections like the freedom from confinement and torture, really, that, that would be conferred with a, a legal personhood protection for animals. And it would be a different class of rights than what, uh, what humans enjoy. But nonetheless, still a lot of pushback on, on this idea. So there are examples here on this slide where rivers are getting protected legislatively and in the courts in countries around the world. And they aren't human. Um, so, and, and we consume resources just like we engage with animals in a consumptive way. So somehow there is the political will to protect non-human rivers with legal personhood and yet not the same will to protect animals. Um, we're also seeing efforts to protect ecosystems. So this is at least an indirect benefit to animals. If we get ecosystem personhood, then we're embracing what's included in the ecosystem. That would be the resources and the, the wildlife uh, and, and certainly the humans that, that enjoy that ecosystem. It's a, it's a more inclusive way of using legal personhood. 
but animal rights activists would still not be satisfied because there is a recent case in uh, out of Ecuador, the Estrellita case, where a rights of nature concept was protecting um, an ecosystem that would ultimately also protect um, animals in that ecosystem, but it's not premised on individual animal rights. It's, protect, it's, it's premised on the idea of protecting an ecosystem, and then that also includes animals, and that's not satisfying to many animal advocates who want animal rights to proceed very much like human rights based on individual liberties and, and entitlements to, to protections under the law. So this is just a reinforcement of the idea of what legal personhood means. A lot of the strategic litigation that we're seeing from, from the animal rights community is about testing what the word person means in given contexts. So habeas corpus, for instance, protects persons who are wrongfully detained and, and worthy of being released. Um, the Copyright Act uh, bestows on persons the right to intellectual property rights. Um, and there's nothing in these laws that say person means human. And so these cases are trying to test what we really mean when we say person. Is it limited to humans? Well, there's, there's this implicit assumption that person means humans, but why, why do we assume that? If the statute doesn't say, or the, the, the doctrine doesn't say it's limited to humans, why, why would it be? Um, so courts have to weigh in and confirm that it's supposed to be limited to humans, even though in many cases they're wrong. So then you've got more of the philosophy behind conferring personhood to animals. Um, and there's the classic slippery slope argument that I'm tired of hearing about, but basically it goes, well, a lot of these strategic cases are about conferring protections to the higher end of the spectrum in the animal kingdom, you know, the, uh, the uh, mammals, the higher mammals, the primates. Um, so we've seen efforts with elephants, we've seen efforts with orcas, uh, chimpanzees. Um, and so the argument would go that even if we agree that these are most like humans and most worthy of personhood protections, where would we draw the line? How would we draw the line in going down the animal kingdom? Uh, are, are lizards next and then ants and then amoebas? I mean, where, where, where do we draw lines here? Um, and so that is certainly a concern about how this might play out, but we'd be in big trouble if the law refused to intervene in deciding what's right simply because it's difficult. <laughs> that's, that, that, that's shame on all of us as lawyers if, if we refuse to try to confer protections simply because it's a difficult and long process. Um, it's taken us over 230 years to figure out what freedom of speech and freedom of religion mean, but we tried and we're continuing to try. Um, and those are recognized as constitutional liberties. Uh, we, we certainly didn't say, nah, it's not worth it because that's gonna take two centuries to figure out. So just because there's a slippery slope concern doesn't mean we shouldn't be making an effort to determine that, that line, whether it's on the basis of science or political will or whatever. Um, and another sense of uh, reluctance is this idea of second-class citizen status, that there would be a limited range of protections that animals would get compared to humans and how that might be a moral concern that reminds us of slaves uh, as three-fifths of a person in that uh, dark period of our, of our country's history. And we, we, we don't want to have that different uh, degrees of rights. It's, it's either an all or nothing kind of thing. And then there's the rights versus responsibilities concern, which you know is really ridiculous, um, but nonetheless out there that animals would be getting the benefit of rights without corresponding responsibilities. You know, how dare they? Um, we, we, we certainly don't complain that human babies uh, are getting rights, but don't have responsibilities. I, I haven't heard anyone make that argument. And yet we do hear the argument that it would be inappropriate for animals to get rights because they don't carry societal responsibilities. We apparently need to get them to pay taxes before they can have rights, um, which is absurd. So, so you, you can see there's a lot of kind of cultural uh, impediments to humans' relationships to animals about our willingness to confer these rights that they ought to have when other non-humans are getting these rights and animals still are not. And it may just be a function of our, our progression on this spectrum of, of a cultural awakening. Um, that we haven't quite reached because of course we we used to have people as property um, in, in the era of slavery. Um, women and children were considered property. Uh, so, so thankfully we've come a long way from that 
dark period in our history. We've had extensive and continue to have problems with discrimination and uh, oppression of, of certain classes of people uh, in our country, but we've come a long way from where we were in that regard. So maybe recognizing personhood for animals is something we're on the way to achieving and haven't yet gotten there. But uh, the law can only do so much as what we as a society are willing to take on. And that's kind of where we are, I think, in a lot of this, that this, this moral awakening about treating animals with the respect they deserve is something that is a transition. Uh, it's certainly not something I grew up with. So it's happening quickly. Um, and um, Hopefully, we'll, we'll uh, arrive very soon for the law to, to enforce that political and cultural will. So as far as collaboration goes, climate change is an area that I spend a lot of time on. And, and this connection between animal law and environmental law is a really important moment we're in right now. So one limitation of how animal advocates have pursued um, um, accountability against factory farms, uh, concentrated animal feeding operations, CAFOs, is that they've often focused exclusively on the animal welfare concerns associated with these operations. And, and there's no denying there are just rampant animal welfare concerns in terms of how, how CAFOs operate. But when you're trying to make that argument to the general public, you're, you're not going to get nearly the degree of buy-in you should about we need to shut these things down, phase them out very quickly in the near future. Um, if you're only arguing on the basis of animal welfare. I mean, just think about our food system. Most of the people you know are primarily meat eaters and you're gonna make an argument based on animal welfare and they're saying, well, you know, I like what I eat. I'm gonna turn a blind eye to the animal welfare concerns in factory farms. But when you add public health and environmental concerns into that mix, you have a much more compelling argument to make. And everyone experienced the pandemic and all the sacrifices and challenges economic and otherwise that have worse than public health wise that were associated with the pandemic loss of lives and illness. And when we think about how CAFOs are very much the leading reason why we are likely going to see the next pandemic if we don't get a handle on phasing out factory farms, that's a much more compelling argument than just talking about the animal welfare concerns, not, not to diminish the animal welfare concerns, but again, the way environmental law connected things to us Animal law can do that as well when we talk about factory farms. Connect factory farms to a threat to your health as a human being, and you're going to get a lot more attention. And then the, the, the ultimate existential crisis that faces all humans and the planet, climate change, factory farms are a big part of the solution for that low-hanging fruit, regulating methane. Methane is like 80 to 100 percent more, um, 80 to 100 times more potent than carbon dioxide. And it's very difficult to regulate carbon dioxide uh, effectively because it's so expansive and it stays in the atmosphere for a century. But if we get a handle on methane very effectively in the short term, that's gonna go a long way in protecting ourselves from the more short and long-term uh, implications of, of climate change. And CAFOs are a significant source of our methane emissions and just a massive source of pollution of other kinds as well. Um, so all of those, taken together make for a much more compelling argument than just focusing on the, the animal welfare piece when we talk about uh, CAFOs. And then you, you, it's important to remind both movements that they are fundamentally about stewardship for the voiceless. Whether you're an animal advocate or an environmental advocate, you are about protecting others who are not human, whether it be rivers or animals. Um, and there are a lot of strategies that are common to these fields when we're talking about protecting in, in this guardianship, stewardship kind of way, um, whether it be animal or environmental resources and how the, the legal strategies have a lot of commonalities. So there are certainly um, legal doctrines that talk about that stewardship idea. Um, so we've talked about how, how legal personhood can be one of those, how legal personhood for ecosystems is one way to be a guardian for a, uh, both animal and environmental concerns. Um, there's also that idea of um, the creativity and persistence that goes along with these creative theories. So I'm starting to see more um, of these collaborations between animal and environmental public interest groups now uh, in the past five years or so, because they have very similar toolkits in how they do their strategic creative litigation uh, campaigns. And it makes sense that a lot of them do align um, on, on animal and environmental 
uh, principles um, to, to go after factory farms, to, to go after other entities that are simultaneously threatening environmental and animal interests. And there needs to be more of that, that partnering because there's a lot to learn from each other's playbooks that's common to both movements' uh, objectives. And just to, to close, I wanna give you two case studies. Um, the first, that's actually the subject of an, a CLE tomorrow that I'm gonna be speaking at, that, that's looking at this evolution of the private sector's deception of the public. When we've developed a more conscientious consuming public, greenwashing developed, trying to convince people that what they were buying or engaging in was going to be environmentally friendly when in fact it really isn't. And then greenwashing paved a way for humane washing. Um, and that was one, an example, for instance, of the idea of humanely raised chickens, how that was just a way to dupe the public into being, uh, thinking they were making a more informed choice about something that was more animal welfare protective, when in fact, it was just a way to charge more for the same production processes uh, for, for chickens. And, and that was an example of one of many examples of humane washing. And now we're seeing the latest version of this called climate washing. And this is essentially both governments and the private sector telling us, trying to convince us that they are very much on track to get us toward net zero by 2050. How, how things that are very much like the status quo are somehow being labeled clean and renewable. Um, you've got companies saying that liquefied natural gas is clean and renewable. Uh, you're getting airlines telling us that they're engaging in off carbon offsets and therefore flying with us is, is a, a form of, of sustainable transportation. Um, all three of these efforts are very much trying to exploit a conscientious public with disinformation that will enable the private sector and the governments to keep doing things that are very much like the status quo. So certainly animal and environmental interests are aligning along these um, efforts to confront these tactics. And that's exactly why this CLE tomorrow and here in Chicago is talking about all three, greenwashing, humane washing, climate washing, and how there's um, a need to, to pool resources against these tactics that continue to go on more than ever. Um, so lab-grown meat is another example of how these two movements intersect. Um, so in an ideal world, we would never need lab-grown meat. In an ideal world, we would transition from factory farms to plant-based, and that's as far as we would need to go. But we're dealing with humans. Humans are fundamentally defective, and they are not going to embrace plant-based food options after being ingrained in a factory farm uh, diet. So the reality is that the intermediate step of getting to a vegan future would be lab-grown meat because taste-wise, the argument is it's indistinguishable from traditional meat. And that's how you're gonna get the, the factory farm meat eaters on board with something that is more environmentally sustainable and more animal protective than our, our status quo. Um, but the challenge with lab-grown meat is that it's not a perfect solution. First of all, there's some animal rights advocates who are concerned that lab-grown meat is derived from animal cells so it's not exclusively animal friendly. And it's perpetuating a paradigm that doesn't have to exist. Why do we have to eat animals of any kind, whether it's just cells or the whole thing? It's perpetuating an, an, an inappropriate paradigm that we should be able to get away from, ideally. Um, and it's also a source of environmental pollution. If, if you're talking about lab-grown meat facilities, they themselves are sources of greenhouse gas emissions. So it's, it's clearly not a perfect solution for environmental or animal advocates, plant-based foods are much, much better for both communities. Um, but because they don't replicate the, the demand of factory farm meat eaters, we may need that intermediate step to lab-grown meat to, to get to uh, fully away from um, reliance on CAFOs. So Cory Booker, a vegan, has already reintroduced legislation that is looking to phase out factory farms over the, the near term in the next few decades. Don't expect that to pass by next week, but <laughs> at least we're having these conversations and ultimately we are on that path. And it's a question of being strategic about what's gonna get us down that path most effectively. You know, if we hold out for the perfect solution, we might not progress at all. So. So there are very strident animal activists that 
do embrace lab-grown meat as something we, we have to embrace if, if we want to get to that, 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 that vegan future of, of protecting animals and the planet as, as effectively as we need to. Um, so I wanted to leave you with that, and I welcome your questions and comments. Thanks for your attention. Questions from Professor Nate? Hi. Hello. Hello, Professor. Um, what are some cases that um, that have been positive, or I'm trying to look at good things about our movement. Um, so, what what cases have you seen? Um, I know I understand that the non-human rights project. I mean, they, they haven't gotten any. I, I don't know of any good decisions. Um, well, well, they haven't technically won a case, but they've certainly made a lot of progress in terms of you know, surviving a motion to dismiss, getting very good language out of the New York Court of Appeals, so mm -hmm. making fantastic progress, but it is a, it's a process. Yeah. What about other, like, have there have been other, any, any good law, any good law for the animals as far as, like, these creative arguments? Yeah. Oh, there certainly have been. I, I think what's... You know, the challenge is this underlying resistance to, to legal personhood. Um, so, so ALDF, uh, we have a, a uh, litigation fellow in the room here for, from ALDF, Michael Sestara, and ALDF is doing some fantastic work. And, and one of the cases that comes to mind and involves Justice the Horse, uh, this idea of a, a lawsuit uh, by a horse uh, against its owner for the uh, abuse and neglect that, that caused significant harm to the horse. And of course, it turns on that idea of if the horse does have legal personhood to be able to sue on its own behalf against its owner. I mean, of course, that has significant implications for our relationship to animals on, on many fronts. You know, that's, uh, again, that sort of planet of the apes reality that a lot of people start to worry about that if we, we recognize the ability of a horse to sue its owner for, for abuse and neglect, then then what does that mean if you forget to feed your cat tomorrow? I mean, it, it, there's there's a lot to overcome about our assumptions about how animals interface with humans and humans being in control, even cracking that door a bit when you've got an egregious example of harm that needs to be addressed by the law through medical uh, expenses and, and attention to to justice the horse. You know, it's that same slippery slope concern. So. So that that's been remarkable in, in, in how far that case has has gone, and um, and and there's certainly efforts um, in in raising the awareness about about um, the entitlement of animals to legal personhood that have not yet gotten that you know clear victory, uh, whether it's whether it's ALDF or PETA or or other organizations. It, it is about continuing to push that envelope and raise the awareness and and influence the legal decision-making until ultimately something will, will stick. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, when you, when you compare that to environmental law, environmental law had that trail blazed so much more readily by the legal system's support of, of what, um, what, what the legal system wanted to see about environmental protection. We don't have that wind at the back with, with animal protection, uh, animal rights initiatives, but it's, it's gaining tremendous traction. It just takes a lot of time. We have a couple of questions online. For lab-grown meat, how close is it to becoming available, being readily available for the greater population? And in comparison to factory farms, what is its impact on the environment? Well, certainly the impact on the environment is far less significant. So uh, like I said, it's not perfect. You know, sources of uh, you know, production facilities for lab-grown meat do generate um, greenhouse gases, but nothing like what we see with uh, the, the pollution impacts of factory farms. And certainly, as far as a, a time scale, what, what I've heard is uh, we're, we're maybe 10 years away. I hope it's sooner than that. Um, it, there, there's been some, some movement in Singapore, I believe, in, in rolling it out on a limited basis. But uh, I'm, I'm hopeful. And a lot of this is about political will. It's important to understand that. So uh, when, when you've got initiatives like what Cory Booker um, introduced and, and efforts to even Biden's administration through executive order to diminish the amount of subsidies that are going to harmful activities. So, so in, in the Biden executive order, it was targeting initially fossil fuel industry and how, how we want to diminish the amount of uh, subsidies that the fossil fuel industry gets. And certainly very much related to that, we want to diminish the subsidies to, 
to animal uh, industrial animal agriculture. So to the extent that those efforts move as quickly as they ought to, and a lot is going to turn on who's elected president in 2024 and, and who's appointed in Congress, um, elected in Congress. But the uh, we're moving in that direction regardless. The, the market is going to take us there, but not nearly as fast as getting the right wind at our backs with uh, the appropriate uh, government uh, support and incentive. So, so we're already seeing that with the Inflation Reduction Act, how much money went into that to support a faster transition along clean and renewable energy path than just waiting for the market to do it. Another question from online. What are some of the unique challenges and potential solutions we face on the ocean front as the polar ice melts? International law seems weaker than domestic law. International cooperation also seems to be deteriorating at the worst possible time. And uh, protecting the oceans was the first part of the question. Yes. Well, I mean, I, I think the best uh, source of inspiration on that front is just last weekend, the um, Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdictions uh, Treaty was, uh, was, was finalized after you know, two decades of, of talk. I think that's a great source of hope for international diplomacy in, in protecting the environment and particularly the oceans in this case. And we've also got a, uh, a global treaty on plastics in the works, and part of which is going to do great things for the, for the marine environment if that is ultimately uh, finalized. There's a lot of good progress there. Um, but I certainly think that at the domestic level, we, we have a lot of tools that are, for, in many ways, more immediate, more potent than what international law can do in, in many ways. And so we need to see more efforts on marine protected areas uh, through uh, federal and state law. And uh, that, that's something that is, is moving slowly, needs to speed up a bit. Um, and, and certainly more uh, ambitious listing and enforcement of protected species. Uh, so, so there's, there's uh, some, some successes there, but a lot more work to do uh, under the Endangered Species Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Uh, again, kind of an intersection of, of environmental and animal uh, protection efforts there in the marine environment. Um, and, um, but, but one example where environmental and animal um, initiatives don't align as well as one would hope is with invasive species. So we've seen a lot of battles between the environmental and animal movement on, on this front. And an example would be in the Everglades, for instance, you've got this um, invasive species, the, uh, the, the, the python that, that was just you know, released either accidentally or deliberately and now is taking over the Everglades. And you know, an environmental uh, view of, of addressing that problem is essentially exterminating this intruder because it's taking over a, a delicate and important ecosystem. Uh, whereas the, the animal law advocates approach is to humanely remove each and every one of those pythons to, a, to an environment where it can thrive. Uh, and so those two approaches are, are very difficult to reconcile uh, when you're facing a common threat with two very different ways of, of confronting the threat. Um, and, and certainly there, there are some kind of middle grounds. So for instance, when there, I believe it was even in Chicago, there, there was a major, a major concern with a rat infestation and, and the typical approach to, to taking care of rat problems is extermination, but instead it was a sterilization approach that was taken, which was much more animal friendly um, that, that you're not just exterminating the rats, you're just preventing them from reproducing and getting a, uh, a handle on the problem without being as much of a uh, in, in, um, you know, violation of, of, of the species right to, to live. So, you know, there are ways where those two sides can come together a little bit, but they're often very much in conflict. Yeah. <laughs> I have a lot of questions. Um, in your previous slide, you were talking about anti-cruelty law protections, uh, federal and international protections, and you mentioned there were three federal laws. I'm assuming one is Endangered Species Act, and you did mention Humane Methods of Slaughter Act. What's the third one? No, so it, the, the Endangered Species Act would not be on that list. So that, oh. that is an environmental law. Uh, it certainly has some related benefits for for, for animal protection, but the, the, the three federal animal laws would be the Animal Welfare Act, oh, okay. uh, the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act, and the 24 hour law, uh, 28 hour law, which is about transportation of, 
Of, oh, of I see. so the Endangered Species, species Act is under environmental law. Yes. Okay. Yes. Although there are some creative ways animal advocates have been trying to use uh, the Endangered Species Act for animals in captivity, but it's uh, essentially an environmental mm -hmm. law. So the uh, animal protection law, the third one is 28-hour law? Yes. So, so that, that, that's a very limited protection of animals that are being transported for slaughter. And then I missed the third, I well, didn't see the third category. Like, so you had the anti-cruelty law protections, federal international protections in the middle, and then... Then, then it was animal rights. So, oh, so, animal so, that, rights. so that third category does parallel the environmental rights as the third category in that previous slide. So even though we've got very different evolutions of the two movements, they are now in a similar space. They're both focusing on rights-based efforts to get more ambitious protections for environment and animals. And, uh, and on that front, environmental law is doing better uh, so far, except in the US. And then finally, I just wanted to say, um, or ask, um, wouldn't you, don't you think that uh, the law being of such a conservative um, venue space um, that we really, I mean, these all these efforts are great, but we really need like a grassroots uh, international animal rights movement to push the law because the law is so like always the last yeah, to move. I agree. So, right. so I, I really think that, you know, I, I, I say this a lot in other talks that the litigation efforts are not about winning one case at a time. They're really a, about building a, a movement that, that ultimately trickles through society and can influence legislative initiatives. So, so when you look at all of the climate justice litigation that's been brought in the US over the past decade or more, most of those cases lost in court, but it built a movement of climate justice awareness in communities around the country that helped us, I believe, get the influence on politicians to pass the Inflation Reduction Act that we saw last fall. I, I really doubt that there would have been the political will for that law to be passed without that consciousness raising, raising that happened with all of those efforts to, to use the court system, even though most of them were not winning. It is about building that, that cultural and political will and lawsuits are one way of doing it, but certainly just grassroots advocacy in general is, is very, very important if we're going to get anywhere. We just can't rely on, on just lawsuits. I have one more question. Sure. Oh, sorry. Sorry, um, Did you follow at all? So the Obama Foundation tore down a thousand trees in Jackson Park, um, just south of here. That was like, you know, designed by um, Burnham and like um, no Olmsted. The like he designed Central Park. He designed all these beautiful parks, and all that like a thousand trees were just completely disseminated. Um, in the south, you know, in, in my neighborhood in Hyde Park, um, mm -hmm. in the, just south of there. And there was a lawsuit filed, um, but I just feel like, yeah, they, they lost and the trees were slaughtered. <laughs> for, for what purpose? What, to build this, uh, not e it's not even a presidential library, it's just like, a, like a, an Obama, like, I don't know, like a center. Oh, like okay. A center for he, he didn't decide to do a library like most presidents mm -hmm. uh, because he didn't want to, I don't know, give up certain papers or something to it. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a center and then they have to build, it's like just an environmental disaster. Like the thousand trees were, sh were, were just torn down and this, you know, beautiful park that was opened for everybody, you know, to go to um, was just, and it's going to be like this concrete structure. And because public transportation is not really accessible there, the city is building like a garage, a parking garage. Uh, so it's just, it was a total nightmare. And yeah. I just feel like, oh, if maybe we had better litigation and like more theories were advanced mm. in the lawsuit. Like, I yeah, I mean, that's that's unfortunate. I mean, we really need to be moving in the opposite direction than, than you know, building more things and, and building more parking to associate building new things. But uh, yeah, especially yeah. since it's, there were like vacant lots where he could have built it, you right. know, but he wanted the lakefront view. Right. Yeah. I mean, there, there are just a lot of local land use politics that go into something like that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really not not so much related to environmental and animal advocacy so much as you know, political and economic power, what that'll get you. And I think that's really the, probably the story there. Um, but yeah, there, there's a, 
When you think about concrete jungles, uh, one, one thing that I've been wanting to do at more of a grassroots level is have some kind of initiative that, similar to what we saw with rails to trails, um, you know, that, that you've got existing infrastructure that's no longer used and turn it into parks and bike trails. I, I would love to see an initiative where that converts just about every mall built in the 70s and 80s that is just like abandoned these days that's convert all of that to parkland. I mean, because concrete is awful for climate change. Uh, adaptation mitigation concerns and they're 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 just everywhere i mean just amazing it's going to be an absolute wasteland of old malls that are no longer used over the next 10 20 years and just converting all of those to uh to parks would be an amazing uh, step forward for habitat restoration and climate change and everything and community building to make those parks yeah if you could project 100 years into the future where we're not eating meat we don't use animals and circuses. Um, we don't have factory farms, et cetera. We don't have horses drawing carriages around Central Park. Where are the animals and what are they doing? Yeah, I mean, that's, to me, putting the clock forward that way is similar to putting it back, you know? And, and I, I have a slide in another one of my presentations where you know, what, what we've lived with and have grown up with is such a speck on the time scale of the planet. So, so there's these two slides I have that are a metaphorical calendar year and humans aren't even on the scene until New Year's Eve. I mean, in terms of the history of the planet. So basically what I see is the future of the planet with, you know, animals and, and their ability to uh, thrive on the planet is really where we were before the industrial revolution that that they animals were certainly used in terms of the, the agrarian revolution they were used to to support uh, agriculture in, in a much more limited way than what they are now of course with factory farms and so there, there there's always going to be some human control over animals but not nearly to the degree that we've seen over the past hundred or so years um, and and that's something we just have to get out of the habit of now that we've got the technology and the the moral awakening about how it's inappropriate and how there are alternative ways to, to live comfortably and not exploit the environment and animals. It's just a matter of letting go of that old paradigm. And it's gonna be very much like where we were before we decided we had to do everything on this grand scale and, and exploit animals at every stage of the process to, to be more comfortable as humans. I, I think we're, we're just at a point where we're going to have all of those alternatives. Think about animal testing. I mean, we, we now have alternatives to achieve the results that reliance on animals was necessary for, and now we can do it on non-animal uh, subjects that are essentially going to get us away from that, that reliance. And the similar thing with, with our food system. I mean, it's just a matter of getting to a point where animals are not that indispensable source of, of exploitation for us to have the comfort we want as humans. So I really think it's gonna be a, a, a slower than it should evolution, but certainly uh, in the next 50 years, a very different place than we are right now. Yeah. Another question from online. Are we getting closer to having all animals free from battery cages, such as chickens and pigs? Europe has banned these, but why haven't we? Well, I mean, we're certainly seeing pro progress on, on a state level with this in the US. Um, it's, it's much slower than it should be. And again, it is about political and cultural will. Um, so for instance, Florida was was a, a leader in, in banning these uh, gestation crates for pigs, um, gestation farrowing crates, and ultimately um, they were able to do that because Florida doesn't have many pork uh, producing facilities. So, you know, okay, it's better than nothing, but it's not a big victory. And so I think to the extent you've got a, a heavy reliance on, on those kinds of methods of doing things that are cheap and, and, and entrenched, uh, you're certainly not going to see Arkansas be a leader on, on any of those uh, uh, animal welfare measures. But I, I think it's, it's certainly at least getting out to those areas where it's less essential to economic security and, and the old way of doing things. So, uh, yes, Europe is absolutely ahead of us on this, um, and, on animal welfare and animal rights on many levels. So I think there's, uh, there's a lot of work to do as animal advocates, and I think a lot of good work is, is happening on those fronts. And a follow-up to that, how can I get involved and keep up with knowing the law regarding this issue of being the uh, battery cage? Well, I think a lot of the leading animal NGOs are, are doing great work on that. So I, I think subscribing to those, those newsletters of uh, organizations like ALDF and uh, Humane Society, and um, uh, I, I believe um, 
maybe the Animal Welfare Institute. Certainly uh, online, there's all kinds of access to national animal NGOs that are actively involved in this, that, that want people to at least follow their work, if not support it in every way they can. So um, that's uh, thanks to the internet, pretty easily uh, obtainable information. And they're, they're great about keeping people informed of their, their victories and their efforts. Another one question. The One Health concept seems to tie animal health and environmental can that concept be, can that concept play a role in animal law and environmental law too? Yes, absolutely. So I think One Health is a very promising development that um, I'm actually co-editing a, a journal that's that's focused on a journal, special journal issue on, on One Health. And, and the idea is really that the pandemic brought to our attention how it's foolish to think about human health as separate from environmental health, as separate from animal health, that we are part of one larger ecosystem and certainly need to be thinking in a way that um, we are essentially all part of a one health uh, uh, aspiration to how our laws need to protect public health is about protecting humans, animals, and the environment simultaneously and not with different objectives. So I think I think one health is a great step forward for, for animal protection. I mean, it's not a panacea, but it's certainly a valuable step forward. Sure. You know, uh, I'm speaking from total ignorance, except uh, I've seen once in a while, occasionally a story in a newspaper, somebody killed a dog or mistreated a dog, and he might be sentenced to six months or a year in prison. Now, the question is, is there been any kind of uh, equal protection for other animals? Did anybody go to court and say, well, the, killing of chickens, the killing of uh, sheep uh, to make uh, lamb chops, the killing of, of, of beef cattle. Uh, has anybody brought any kind of case like that on an equal protection uh, argument? Yeah, I mean, the equal protection ground is, is, is not going to be viable, but certainly the, uh, you know, the, the, the political will, uh, the cultural will is not there because in our society, companion animals are, are valued at a much higher level and therefore the law is conferring more protections for, for companion animals compared to animals in agriculture that are just, is, is a blank check for exploitation compared to animals that are considered uh, vermin or pests. They ultimately don't get any legal protection either even though all of them are, are living, breathing in many cases sentient beings. Um, the, it's very difficult to get the law to protect something that the societal will is not behind. So as long as we're treating uh, animals in agriculture as expendable and, and uh, animals we perceive to be pests as expendable, they're, they're never going to get the protection that the law affords to companion animals because they are so valued by, by, the, the, by the human companions that, uh, that, that own those animals. So there, there have been some cases where, you know, other than companion animals have have gotten some traction in, in the courts to, uh, to, to get some protection. We talked earlier about a, a case involving a horse uh, suing its owner for, for abuse and neglect, but those are, those are very cutting edge uh, cases that and they're not nearly the, the body of law that we see protecting companion animals. Yeah. When it comes to alternative meats, um, I noticed that like things like insects and bugs for a source of protein has sort of gained traction. Do you see that going anywhere or do you think that that's going to kind of fall by the wayside? Well, I mean, I think there's some place for it. I, I think, again, ultimately it comes down to people's willingness to, to um, go away from the status quo. So, so ultimately it is about taste. If there's a way for that source of protein to, to be as satisfying taste-wise as traditional factory farm meat, then I see hope for it. But my sense is that it's, it's not going to reach that level. And so you're not going to see steak lovers transitioning to bugs as their source of protein anytime soon. I just think there's not going to be that, that you know, substitution factor about taste and satisfaction. And so I think that's one source of uh, a way away from factory farms. But it's going to be hard to do without that lab grown meat piece because that is the true substitute. So I'm told uh, taste wise. And, Satisfaction wise. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, uh, two questions, uh, and it'll be my last one. I have not wrapped myself to see the conspiracy film yet, just because everything is just so depressing and just like, uh, I don't. 
I already know. But I do, I did want to ask you, is it true that by 2045, um, the oceans are going to be dead? If we're proceeding with like, as, you know, normal. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> certainly the, you know, the, the, the data that I'm aware of is that, you know, uh, 80 to 90 or more percent of all fisheries in the wild are, are overfished to the point that they are, they're near collapse. So if, if you just project that out another 30 years with you know, no end in sight in terms of our appetite, um, that's a huge problem and that could very well live up to that prophecy. And then we've got the problem with uh, aquaculture, which, which is not much better. It's very much like factory farms at sea. And, and you know, if, if we're gonna overfish the, the wild stocks to the point that we're exclusively dependent on aquaculture, that's got a whole set of other problems, uh, animal welfare wise and public health wise. So uh, again, it, it's about how readily we're able to transition away from that appetite for wild caught and, and uh, aquaculture raised fish as opposed to alternative proteins uh, that, that, that resemble fish. So um, that's, that, that remains to be seen. And I think the, you know, the, um, the, the, the alternative protein movement I think has the longest way to go when it comes to alternative fish. I mean, at least for my taste buds. Um, so um, that's that's going to be a challenge for, for the industry. Um, and, but but you know the uh, those the, those lab grown um, efforts. It, what I'm told is that the you know the the, the steak and the salmon are, are really doing very well in terms of replicating the, the original taste. So that that might be enough. <laughs> and my second part of, to my question is what um, animal rights authors and thinkers and philosophers do you like, um, you know, do, do you like and have read and really like cutting edge? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say I, I haven't read someone's work that I didn't find valuable at some level. So so I, I, I wouldn't say that I have a favorite per se, but I think all of them inform me about things that I hadn't thought about on my own. So whether it's Peter Singer, who was one of the very early ones, or or like the Gary Francione in terms of the, the vegan advocacy piece, or uh, you know Steve Wise has done a lot of writing on, on in connection with his work on the non-human rights project. They're, they're they're all just great thinkers on these issues, and and I think they're all worth reading because uh, every one of them comes from a slightly different camp, and often they don't get along. <laughs> but uh, it's important to be informed about where they're all coming from, just like in my philosophy education, I wanted to read the Greeks and the Europeans and the Americans, and it all informed my, my kind of set of beliefs as a philosophy student. Thank you. Sure. Are there any nations that you see sort of like being on the cutting edge or being at the forefront of this movement? Well, I would say there are certainly some, some impressive strides in Europe about um, personhood recognition for, for animals, primates. Um, and Latin America, certainly in the court system, we're seeing more progress there on some of the legal personhood uh, efforts uh, in Colombia and Argentina, Brazil. Um, I think Spain has, has recognition of, of uh, primates having, uh, having legal personhood or sentient being protection. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's a little bit in a lot of different places. Um, and I think the US is probably as active, if not the most active in terms of the efforts to secure these protections. But I think both politically and legally, our system has a lot of barriers compared to some other um, legal systems that are getting ahead of us a bit. And is, is it Israel like the most vegan nation? Yes, yeah, Israel certainly is uh, yeah, doing very well in that regard, yeah. Other questions? Anything online, Brett? I'm making one last request. Um, I have a question. Uh, I'm often asked how, why animal law when there's so many other pressing needs. So we need more education. We need to address poverty, homelessness, um, democracy itself is under attack. And so how, how do we turn our attention to something like animal law and animals? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that is, is really a question that animal law has faced ever since you know, it began uh, mm -hmm. 50 years ago or so. And I think these days it's, it's an easier question to answer because of the way 
our relationship with animals intersects with so many other things about the health of our society, you know, as a public health issue, as an environmental protection issue, as a just a, a, a moral compass about how we're evolving as, as humans. You know, I, I think it was a Gandhi quote about how you know, <laughs> that the, the moral value of society is measured by how we treat the, the animals. And so I think there's really that sense of, you know, with our rights-based thinking these days and, and how quickly in the grand scheme of things, certain groups have been able to secure rights that didn't have rights 10, 20 year, years ago. I think it's it's a time now for us to to look at animal rights as saying, this is this is a, a very important part of our evolution as society to to get to a better place in terms of health, you know, mental, physical health, societal well-being, our relationship to animals and how we can improve it. Uh, is a is a classic win-win, and that's why it deserves our attention. It's not something about you know the, the luxury of thinking about animal rights. It's part of our advancement as a society, as a legal system. Is there anything this year, like in 2023, any upcoming cases and the upcoming topics that you are excited about with animal law? Well, there, there's certainly a lot of strategic litigation going on that uh, I, I'd love to, to observe and too many to mention really, but all of the major NGOs have, have cases going on that's, that's, that are really important. I mean, one that's close to my heart is the, uh, is the Dormant Commerce Clay case involving the, um, uh, the, the California law and uh, the effect of, of having a, a moral objection to, to production processes and that impact on national commerce flow. Um, so I think that's very significant, not only for animal law, but for a lot of different concerns, including environmental law, about testing the limits of the dormant commerce clause there. Um, and so I, I think there's also anything that's connecting to personhood, I think is very big for animal and environmental law, and those cases are continuing to move forward. I'm also interested in this one health concept also to, uh, to see how that's going to test a bit of, of how the courts and, and uh, the law generally is going to weigh in on, on giving more protection to animals with this new approach of the One Health paradigm uh, and, and what the law can do to, to, uh, to move that forward. And all efforts on, um, on, on factory farm phase outs. You know, I've, I've linked that with the phasing out of fossil fuels and how they're very much alike and how these two movements need to work harder to, to push, particularly legislatively, but also in the courts. Um, to, to get us down that phase out uh, fast. Yeah. Um, some animals eat other animals. Yeah. So is there a way to make those animals vegan? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've never been concerned about what nature has established as a pecking order, if you will, because you know a lot of that you know, a lot of times I'll hear the argument that, well, you know, you're, you're an indigenous people's advocate, but how can you support indigenous peoples as an animal advocate? Because indigenous peoples have been harvesting uh, animals, including whales, and, and that really drives animal advocates crazy. And, and I always come out on the side of indigenous peoples because to the extent that there is a cultural and a spiritual tie and respect for animals in a way that animals are harvested, I don't have a problem with, with, with meat eating on that basis. I have, I have a problem with factory farming. I think it's so unnecessary and it's created so many problems for society. Um, and, and likewise, there are existing realities that are exploitative between humans and between animals, uh, predator-prey relationships that are, have been there um, throughout the planet's history and will continue to be there. And those aren't the things that are pushing us toward the end of the planet or society. It's, it's really these modern day inventions of, of this unnecessary reliance on cars and this unnecessary reliance on fossil fuels. Those are the things we need to get a handle on. And a lot of the other things that are less than perfect will, will be just fine if we get the big culprits tackled by the legal system. Are you mostly optimistic about the future of this? I, I'm an optimist by nature, so um, that's probably one of my greatest flaws, but one thing that keeps me going as well. So I think that we're really at a moment in time where, where I think both the, the political will, the cultural transformation, and the use of the legal systems is, is potentially going to get us to a better place in the near future, not because it's something that we sat around and pontificated is the right thing to do, but because we have to. And, and I, I have faith in humans 
ability to respond in the face of emergencies. And we are facing an emergency with the climate system, with our food system, with a lot of societal inequalities. I think the, the awareness of, of how we're very much at a tipping point on many levels is, is becoming common knowledge. And that's the political will we need to, to get to a better place in the near future. And it should have happened much sooner, but that's just human nature. We, 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 we wait until the last minute to get things right. I think we have time for one more question. I am fast to laugh. <laughs> well, this is irrelevant, but the best semester I ever had in college was in Washington, D.C. American University has a program every spring semester. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, I read the paper, our mayor Lightfoot, she partook in that also. I was there in 1959 when. Dwight Eisenhower was still president. And I just love Washington, D.C. You know, I envy you. <laughs> and we had our sessions down there before going out to all different agencies of government and yeah. non government. And uh, your neighborhood there at George Washington, I, they had the, uh, so the Washington semester. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Program. Yeah, that's still going. Do you yeah. still have it there in yeah. your neighborhood there? Yeah, I, I, I taught at an undergrad university that participated in that program. It's still going strong, yeah. Yeah, I envy you. It's yeah. a, such a beautiful place it to be. It really is. It's a wonderful place to, to live and to work. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wait, sorry, we do have one more question from online. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we have four minutes. Government subsidies favor animal agriculture. How can plant-based food get more attention there for helping it compete in the food chain? Yeah, that's that's really where where we need to be advocating our our elected representatives. So um, in in Canada, as as a source of hope, there was a um, uh, at least federal financing for a plant-based food facility. I, I believe in um, uh, it was either British Columbia or. One of the Western provinces, but but I think that that's something that that's perhaps the first step. That that if if we've got so much government subsidies and government support through financing for other activities that are not nearly as good for society as a transition to plant-based food, that's where I think a lot of the legislative advocacy of the animal uh, protection movement needs to be focused on because that can get change to happen a lot faster than traditional litigation only. Uh, and so I think that, uh, you know, that awareness is starting to sink in because especially when you're in this, this national budget crisis and people become aware of the billions of dollars are, that are being thrown at the fossil fuel industry and, and industrial animal agriculture, there are so many better ways for that money to be spent. I think that's a bipartisan issue that, that we can all get around and say, this is just not the way our tax dollars should be spent. Do you know things like the new Green Deal movement have had have any focus on this, or are they focused on other things? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's some space there in the, in the, you know, the Green New Deal approach. It's very intersectional, and so the idea is that really it's capitalism is is the is is the core problem of of a lot of the challenges we're facing, whether it's environmental or or animal exploitation wise. And so, I think there's a way for environment and animal um, advocates to work around that idea, that work together on that idea, uh, idea that moving away from our traditional capitalism is going to get us to a better place for the planet and for, for animals and for um, disproportionately burdened groups. Uh, so it's, uh, climate change isn't an environmental issue, it's a societal issue, and exploitation of animals is, is absolutely a societal issue that, that can be paired in a lot of the political transformation we need to see to protect vulnerable uh, communities of all kinds. What ag gag laws were struck down? I didn't know about those. Say again? You said uh, some of the ag gag laws have been struck down as oh, unconstitutional. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like I wasn't familiar with those cases. Do you? Oh yeah. Well, yeah. I, I think if you go to the uh, Animal Legal Defense Fund's website, you'll see a you'll see a map. Uh, I believe there's been like five or six states that at least that have been um, struck down, and many more are, are under attack. I don't have the the names right. of the states at uh, offhand. Good, I'm glad you just had a positive note. North Carolina was just last week. Oh, that's <laughs> 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 
Well, thank you again. Thank you. Any final thoughts? I'm just glad all you came out and uh, keep fighting the good fight. I'm happy to be a resource for anyone to continue the conversation. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.